Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. I'm Kyle DeCuyen, and I am the executive director of the Poetry Project. Um, I'm so grateful to be gathered with all of you and with Joselia Rebecca Hughes and Jimena Lucero tonight and with guest introducers Akima Zane, who will be introducing Joselia Rebecca and Saray Jarrell Johnson, who will be introducing Jimena. Um, both of these readers remind me so deeply how radical and important and frankly insurrectionist care can be. And I think within the context of this weekend, this week, this year, this nation, I think um, the questions and possibilities and emphases these poets pose are just truly restorative and original. And so I'm just deeply appreciative uh, to be with them and experiencing their work tonight. Before we get too deep into this event, I do also want to attend to some general structure for tonight. I would like to thank everyone at the Poetry Project who is making sure this event runs as smoothly and thoughtfully as possible and hopefully without any malicious intrusion. So thank you to James Barrickman, Corey Hutchinson, and Nicole Wallace. Um, Corey is going to drop a link now for Zoom FAQs into the chat. We'll keep this public chat open in case anyone wants to express accolades or admiration or just to say hello. Um, your microphones are switched off for the time being and you're welcome to keep your video camera either on or off. Please just note that uh, this event is being recorded. So if your camera is on, your face may be visible at some point in the archived video of this event. In the upper left corner of the Zoom screen, I also wanna note that there's a link for the live transcription through Otter AI in case anyone may appreciate having access to that feature. We're doing our best to maintain safer space within this digital perimeter. And I'll ask Corey now to share with everyone our statement of safer space. If you do receive any unwanted private communications in the course of this event, please just chat any of the Poetry Project staff identified with the appellation staff and we'll get it taken care of right away. Um, if we were gathering tonight, as we have for 50 years in shared place as well as time, we would be in the parish hall of St. Mark's Church. We are committed to continuously and critically engaging the history and future of our presence in this particular space. And as part of that, we would like to acknowledge that our venue, as well as the place I'm speaking from tonight, is built upon unceded indigenous lands, specifically the territory of the Lenape people. We recognize the continual displacement and violence perpetrated against indigenous people and people of color by the US and are aware that these kinds of acknowledgements can be misused as stand-ins for actual decolonization work, which is something for us to bear in mind as we go forward in our ongoing commitment to accountability, reparation, and equity. We invite you to join us in this work from all of the different places where you are and are sharing another resource in the chat, a map through nativeland.ca, not as an endorsement of this resource's completeness, but as a starting place for those we hope might feel encouraged to consider in new ways, the histories of the places where we are. We usually set up the chairs together and put them away together in the parish hall at St. Mark's. And I find that even as we gather in these more remote grids, our community is still finding ways to make and hold special listening space together. So thank you for being with us and for figuring it out with us. Um, we have made all of these online programs free and we've also continued to pay poets and artists for their readings, performances, teaching, and writing. So if you feel moved to offer your support for this work, Corey's placing a link to donate in the chat. And now I'm going to turn things over to Akima Zain, who will be introducing Joselia Rebecca Hughes. And then after Joselia reads, 
Saray Jarrell Johnson will come on to introduce Jimena Lucero, who will close the night. Thank you so much for being with us and thank you to Akima Sain. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. When I first met Joe, I was late for rehearsal. My back was hurting and I did not know exactly or have a clear vision of what I'd be miming as performance. I, for one, believe that you don't always know what will come of you, the stage, the audience, until the moment comes. I'm dressed of my outerwear and tried to quickly arrange my things in as much silence as I could manage. Joe greeted me before I could conclude. We embraced in a mutual trust of the purpose of which we were coming together. I looked over at her knee in our seated postures to review the book she was reading. Sister Love, The Letters of Audre Lorde and Pat Parker, 1974 to 1989. An omen, if you will. Evidences of numbers dear to us and people, people. People who some may call Luddites, nonetheless, or more acutely, ever the more, evidence. People, your people with people, 67, blackable. To this evidence, I return always, then and now, to a humble will. I also wish to draw our attention to to a provocation by the author of Blackable, which reads, I need not know which for insanity and dreaming allow what sanity does not and that is existence of belief without the burden of proof. Proofing your truth is a burden. Proofing your truth is pathological, page 75. Thank you, Joe. For in this articulation, I am relieved of any burden to perform any of what you and I know as true. But to those who are meeting J.R. Hughes today and are here to listen to read her here on out, I think I can assure that there is undoing, which is to say that what I know is true is that the precision in which the author translates care on the page requires reckoning of all sorts, but certainly that of time, of language, of the beat, of the able, of the state, of the word, as in, do we actually ethic to the words that are coming out of our mouths? Sorry. <laughs> Do we actually ethic to the words that are coming out of our mouths? Do we even care to understand, to be understood? To which when and to whom of what are we making these decisions? In the chapter, Intensive Care Care Unit reads a poem. Ability is a capital need, number five, boron. B. I, the diligent reader, attended to a role of tasks. What is boron? I happen upon the place where it is most abundant, Turkey. Turkey is a key NATO ally. U.S. total imports of agricultural products from Turkey total 900 million in 2019. Imports, food, hospitals. Society affords sickness, poverty first. Understand, healing is a privilege. 
to require beyond other capital need, J.R. writes. I unconcern myself with the things I can't control and control and concern myself with the things I can. The rehearsal where I met Joe, my back was hurting. I don't remember how the conversation of backs took centerfold, but to remedy my pains, Joy, Joe gave me oils infused with CBD. In, sorry, these days, I don't know much about what we've been naming as privilege, but I am very deeply grateful for all of the ways, Joe, you care and incite in me more capacity to will myself to many of its matters. And I'm very grateful for the ways you care to share in choosing with us this evening. Thank you. Uh, can y'all hear me? Um, thank you, Akima. <laughs> wow. Um, I am so thankful to be here with all of you tonight. Um, I'm so thankful uh, for the Poetry Project, uh, for you, Akima, um, Kyle, Laura, um, Saray, him and I, like, thank you so much. Um, so tonight I will be reading from my first book, which still desires a home. Um, it is a book I have named Blackable. And uh, I wanted to do something funky, but I'm just gonna read it straight. So this is from the first chapter bed rest room, bed rest, rest room. And I am in my bedroom right now. I'm in pain right now. We just gonna start where it starts. <laughs> January 22nd, 2018, Facebook post. <laughs> Things have been hard since December 22nd when my back pain opened. When pain shapes hard, I have the arrangement of closing my eyes and listening to Miles Davis, something I've done for years. You know, when someone gets you, well, I get him. He had sickle cell too. He had a beauty in him so strong he had to blow it out. He had sickle cell too, which means he had crises too. And when he had crises, he probably had a lot of the same thoughts I have. Like on Mondays, I ask God for mercy. And on Tuesdays, I ask God for forgiveness. And on Wednesdays, I ask God to kill me. And on Thursdays, I don't speak with God at all. It's Monday and Sunday already dealt with today's mercy. It's Monday and I've been feeling something else. I've been wondering if God is the specific I should be seeking or if by studying God, I am admitting to myself. And I wonder if that matters. I wonder what I hold. I do not have a trumpet. I do know how morphine injects sharp and tastes faint metal good. And I do know sometimes I can feel my cells sickling and all that beauty held in for the trumpet. I exhale for something else. Something else is like Lamaze breathing, but not. Something else is holding on when I think I can't. I always hold on, cause God never says anything back. Nothing clear at least. I'm not religious. I'm just saying, 
I do not have a trumpet, probably won't ever. I knit my own stuff because the tick of knitting needle sounds like music. I type on the computer because the click of keys sounds like music. And I long to know my song. I long to stop my hurt. I long for a lot of things. And I cower knowing longing for an able body is a slap in the face to every other cell that doesn't get a chance to sickle again because those bodies got a response from God. And that response from God means a different kind of quiet. I don't know. I am not religious. Maybe trumpets are endemic and everyone writes songs. Maybe I am a real old person in a real old body with a lot of people telling me to live forward present ship. Of course, is there much choice? Old grows older until it doesn't and songs sing even when we don't. And I ask God questions one click, key click at a time, where the only meaningful response I'll get is the one I can't share. I don't know. I'm not religious. <laughs> Larynx. Hydrogen. Annually, I experience a writer's sickness called aria absentitis. I lose my voice completely or near completely and am otherwise left feeling fine. Voice loss or aria absentitis can last for a day up to many weeks. Healing often blossoms out of the care of non-use, rest. When the inflammation of quiet subsides, my throat escapes sound through chorus, not lone croak. Steady voices emerge, and I we I molt new. Let's talk about lithium. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Wait, no, can, can we not? That's a keyed up train of thought. Sometimes my besties and I stomp and belt. The Krusty Krab pizza is the pizza for you and me together. Besties loved me as a little pick me, screw with me, ain't laugh, while out, got me into shit, lying on our behalf. I guess bucking authority with limber prostration is how we learn to become society. Larrikins with speckled luck, book-wise, street-wise, life-wise, tooking kids when they were kids, murked themselves to avoid Tresvant sensitivity, ended up like Sharon Moonstruck. All my besties be someone to someone else, child, parent, sibling, friend, abstract says Jabba resurrect us is to wake up the dead, go acapella with responsibilities, clogs, two-step with the mule's hoof, say what up to Zora, don't shuck about it. Now we trying out something. Q. When I was a little pickney, not too long ago, depends on how you use a watch, my feet left the ground. Sky was red, not sanguine, dusty, like how old Porous Road used to be before the cross country highway was built. I was MAGA, which means skinny, which means twiggy, which means my umbrella was bigger than me. It was so windy, trash paper pirouette, not a wet gutters, tree leaves shuffling like church hand plans, flicking back and forth cause the ceiling fans out. And July's humidity makes the air thick enough to chew. Catch this, the wind was shoving me like the school kids who use the inexhaustible power of potential force to propel my head into the school bus window. I was playing my classic Nintendo device, plastic green, sturdy, Wario Land, grainy and early in course. And all I saw was a limb in the air next to my head, which was resting on the back of the seat in front of me. And then like Wario's power move, chick, 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 pow. My head went into the thick glass window. I yelled or cried or tried to not do either. They laughed and said I did it to myself. The wind was shoving me around like that and I ain't fight back. This was the first in a series of surrenders I, I needed to make. Bumbershoot did its business, consulted Mary Poppins first and took me on a ride a few inches off of the ground. I, 
I hovered because physics was handing out lessons. So many of you know, I am strangely obsessed with Paul Beatty. So this is my dedication poem to Paul Beatty. My favorite weekday, a node to Paul's beatitude, number eight, oxygen. I'm reading the words of the apostle Paul and he's rapping about the moment I'm nestled in. He's rapping about blackness gonging all ohm and how neat it is to run relays with a pen, especially when industry says it is only market categories we can write unless market niche calls for it. When market niche don't call, America's vocal register is suddenly missing racks. Paul is, by definition, that nigga, original G, tomcat strapped with a slammer shank and a jagged little thrill of a sawed off shotgun with that roly, roly, roly and a dab of ranch, cut jeans over slender legs, paws sporting New Balance sneakers to avoid a narrow path. Beatty is the kind of nigga to make paper airplanes with Jesus and shows up at the cookout after everyone's full and the caucus is near over and yawns are shuffled into the active Uno pile. PB's about public broadcasting, the quiet after the after party, yoking up quiet by the collar, shaking it vigorously, shouting a freestyle, snapping a skateboard, shrieking in tongues, getting up and getting up in folks wake woke faces, showing them what punk's really about and painting the whole shit black. He machetes life with ink and papes and for fuck's sake, he's what I call an apostle of hustle. Don't know you know, but baby, white boy shuffle means Cupid shuffle them feet and let's go exploring. Pros got me Gillespie because bus driver's cruising his graveyard route along the same map, and I love a grape drink jaunt, but got a predisposition to motion sickness. I read Beatty's pages face fast slow because text is a four-letter home word. Emergency waiting. Waiting room. When asked, what is your job title? It is never personal, never personal, never personal. There are no more persons in the personal. We are personnel, an abstraction of person assigned to taking humanizing into some scale of extraction that people don't need. Miss Hughes, I'm just doing my job. The registered employee shares. The registered employee tips me a down cross look. The record asks, do you have a job, yes or no? The problem with yes or no questions is I do not enjoy the task on choosing my position and your position to ask. October 23rd, 2018, Instagram. The word of the day is beats. Beats, beats, bees. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Product placement is signage indicating experience of or tolerance to abuse. I'ma beat your ass, he beat her, she beat him, they beat them, some war, no win. October 28th, 2019, 1431, Uptown 4, sent home, left terminal early. Tears this morning. New and full moons always mean a regular sleep. Awoke around six, five, Browse some, then hop back into slumber. I feel a bunch of blooming pains that had been waiting for this time of year, this time of cold to present the arrangement of its garden. My leg aches, my neck, my back, all alternating or together, throbbing, then sharp, slicing, then dull, feeling like someone else's pulses. Many days have elapsed since my last entry and I have no interest or energy to report on or item the scale and scope of individual injuries. There have been many relentless time and sensitive injustices, injuries masquerading as innocent kindnesses, injuries and violences reliant upon the necessitated vagueness bought an imprecise metaphor, crowded by the satisfaction of intending well without doing different. I am exhausted. I am bored by society's violence, reread pettiness. I am intolerant to mediocrity. I am made ill by the state's performance of delusion 
of erasure as a means to enter eternity. I keep entertaining the limits of doubt like I'll learn something different, like doubt will reveal itself a solution. And I know I've got a fastened belief more now than ever. I have to believe beyond the structures of societal reality. And I have to live to believe inside borderlessness of all, of is, of be, that vibration, that buzz. I have to believe because all of this existing in the world is nothing but believing. I'll be back. Headache developing. We'll get food when off train, journal, le journal later. Win no war, some them beat they, him beat she, her beat he as yo. The word of the day is beats. Beats, beats, bees. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Product placement as signage, indicating experience of or tolerance to abuse. My daddy was a spirit thief. I still cry over it, neon. My daddy was the kind of man to fuck others to see himself. Not just fuck, fuck to make a new generation so he could claim ch clear children made opaque without support payments. A lot of men who call him men without choice do this fuck to make a bad habit fuck to make a careless chore jaw and bone soup in kitchen's habit i write a roll of what the poem could read this roll to recipient as receipt to recipe I have a slight lisp, overcompensated for through tireless exercise. Disable body work to life practice. Who is IOI practicing for? All right, troop, let's stitch a zoot and pick our jaws to John Bone Soup. What assembles gravity in a grief lock? Three anemic toys called trinkets, 11 dashes of dope. 14 splashes called sink drinks and 95 wishes in soap. A beer can in a gutter, a mothball in her wink, a map free in a stutter, a toolkit to her think. Six months shrunk in by a pain that, five milligrams by mouth seek to close. 22 prospects to an utter. One eye we eye stitched in by claws. We are you can remember and us blow to our blouse. Spike spears never captured, return to sender. Do I we eye tongue muscle in where are your mouth? An abstract to Solange Beryllium. Took six tracks to find the flow. I'm spinning on repeat because the flow in the floor is the flow. Hey, hey, hey. The flow keeps three or more. Not sure how to write it beyond example. Hey, hey, hey. Example is positive proof, correct comes more than once. Earlier, I came up with an underthought hypothetical situation. KT and I were discussing historical correctness, what power correct courses. I said, in a land, we have access to view two people. A bomb drops, Mr. Henry Bemis. One person is able to take cover and in cover feels awarded, get safe. One person is unable to take cover and in ability, their leg is blown off. The first person, body safety, still covering feel, says the bomb isn't that bad. The second person, disabled, cannot spell bomb without cold sweat shuddering, living physical sums of remembering. Who is correct? In this scenario, I've neglected ideal, no bomb exists, and I've neglected inevitable, everyone dies.
We doing okay, everyone? Hope everyone's good. One, two, three, part one, boron. Shoot your shot before you get shot by a cop. Corpinthians 7-4, said by our favorite hood queer on Twitter. Funny, the way sober funny, the way sober absurd on its own an altered state of consciousness. Funny, the way growling hunger funny, got to feel, to think, to appear and consume a pear and consomme food. Cruelty being certain manifestations, especially when available abridged by 13 volumes. Funny, the way to hand funny, as expressive as the face if trained in subtlety. This tweet funny like pain, a pin meeting no intervening intervention. So the body be a planet, a planned net, trails and rivers and lands and courses and oceans borderless, allowing body flow planet like time like one all. Pain flows time and contracted equals hours, a minute is a year, is a week, is a day, is a life. Part two. Funny alters us. Hunger got to feel, to think, to appear, and con me. Cruelty be certain, bridge by 13, expressive face train, subtle, tweet pain, a pin, meet intervention. So the body be a planet, a plan net, allow net like one all, contract equal, is a, is a, is a, is a life. Notes from an emotional cosmologist, Boron. My need to formally form form is a specific shift into human of which I was previously underwhelmed. In Hood Index 33, me, a photon jutting along the jaunting spine of space time, human underwhelmed me. It's the preconditions. If we accept the importance of the ellipsis as elliptical, perhaps you sense my science, my cells act as sickled sharp counsel evolving from survival running real long. So much resentment rests in the forgetfulness of survival, survival in form, in shape, in body, and body. I was born to remember to forget differently by the way of emotional cosmology of fading strategy science. I meet with others others who carry fading strategy sciences, and we share them knowing the interdependence of human to human skin contact, knowing we have survived before reincarnating now, reincarnating now, and we know we think about death same different. I meet with others and we talk about death gone in all kinds of ways, but we call them memories, a softened blow for death is not always bitter. I have resented the view of white tees, white gays for so long, I rejected sex altogether. In rejecting sex, I rejected on weak principle, the meta-relational definitions of sex, fuck, bitch, and never uttered cunt, cunt, a slur I had heard only white women cry over long after the numbered world women had died to cry. In rejecting sex, I also rejected gender for the binary taxes at an awkward scale, and there are many failings to real rational numbers. I do not think of slavery as happening time distant from myself. I do not think of slavery as happening away from yesterday, but do not imagine it into tomorrow. This is not a denial. It is a careful creation of earth time without clocks tick. I see an assembly of black condition, feeling, tude, system, color, abridgment, breaking the duration of white sin sign. Wave goodbye. Intensive care unit. For whiteness profits our bodies and captures our minds and its immorality, magnesium. Rage carries me. 
screaming, breaking glass and splitting century stones. Loose is the little girl known loose cannon. I am black, I am disabled, I am a woman, I veer. I do not rely my silence into text tiles. When whiteness tells me you are beautiful, it really means maintain evisceration in order to helicopter some flesh in the air for whiteness, whiteness's vainglorious sake. Whiteness cannot assess without murder and theft. Whiteness seizes the world and does not live in it. Whiteness has attempted, attempt in me to love it, thinks if I understand how to fuck it, I will understand its mealy rotten tenderness, thinks if I understand to fuck it, I'll become human like it, and I have let it happen, I have witnessed my own white death and written my own white eulogy, here rests a soul who, here rests a soul who scared her way into heaven, does God discard her too? When whiteness says you are beautiful, it means I, we are now subject for tame. I am growing too truly. Whiteness twists name dignified freedom of self savage for black. Yet whiteness's domination in modern parlance does not permit such fits of spitting. Whiteness rides in its own words by derealizing de time's apparent fullness to bend hood index branches, implication of direct made straight lines. Whiteness knows it cannot safely time travel because it must destroy home to breathe, to wealthy, to touch Mars. Time traveling reveals the when of where to what, but who of how in whiteness. I, we, I, not seduced by supposition of separateness of past and present and future. Me, am black, me, am disabled, me, am women, me, am veer, way I yo textiles. The moments I rest from stitching the torn parts of my experience are the moments whiteness calls me immoral. Whiteness loves to tell me precisely where flesh me fails, always finds notice when me stop working, when me say whiteness is cruel for noticing my movement but not my creation, it shoots and slip names me, hashtag mouthy. Whiteness plants words, blackness absorbs to survive. Whiteness agitates black people's stomachs with vigor, spaces starting some of undetonated bombs line in black. Whiteness depends possible and unnavigable patterns of violent repetition and says the literally impossible thing is to breathe. We are impossible and whiteness has papered claim from audacity to hope to love my body. Take your fucking hands off our necks. Back the fuck up. Some of us time, pen, time bend and are entirely frightening. Whiteness is never air to put in one's lungs. When some, when of where to what, but who of how does blackness breathe? I, we, I, angry and demanding to topple this sacrilege named state, misnamed whole universe. No more whiteness showing up at the service and using the program as a fan knowing damn well reverence ain't a right procured by earning. My birthday is the 43rd anniversary of Hiroshima, is Jamaica's Independence Day, is Tompkins Square Park riots. England held all of my mothers in its grip. I do not willingly trust any power but my own. Way I yo do it all. Way I yo sew it together. Abel, novel character, never written complete, was an imaginary friend because animals will steal your jewels, sulfur. She is able. He is able. They are able. We are able. Friends are able. Love is able. Are you able? Am I able? Able. I was able. Fable, capable, debatable and traceable, justifiable and disposable, regrettable and changeable, lovable, likable, desirable, believable, noticeable, relatable, nah. Manageable and reliable, preferable, interchangeable, inevitable and adaptable. Abel, my friend, is murdered in ways we've seen and ways we haven't. One day, Abel is inability to make, and the ops find some probability to make his body comparable to a pinata. Are you able to eat? Weapons are able, part of their claws, 
formidable, transformable. I can't yet say what all else happens with Abel. He's not able to visit me anymore. And um, I'm gonna stop on this one. I had a dream about Percocet or morphine, but definitely not fentanyl. I do not remember fentanyl. It killed back memory so my body could survive. Iron. Rather, I think I had a dream about Percocet or morphine. I wake up thinking about those little pills I take every so often to combat the conditions I was born into. The conditions, of course, are sickle cell, white supremacy is black, whatever woman shorns, whatever disability exposes. I want to believe my thinking was dreaming because if it wasn't, that means something I am weary from too long tolerating is spinning round, coming back, going at me and I needed to stop going so I could go. It's colder now. Them summer green leaves crunched up brown, scraping the ground, and the wind is flicking hard, whipping like I'm running for my assigned field work. Field work ain't easy when the body is a barometer, a thermometer, someone's optometrist, the deaconess, east bearing compass, industry's finest implement, they rename tool, fool, you know what I'm saying, some kind of gauge that circles and sickles depending on conditions I cannot control over. I am orbiting divinity. At times, I talk myself into God's being so we ain't have to feel the machine grind our righteousness into indolence so the wheelchair user never meets the border of stare, so the cell doesn't sickle without the safety of care, so the person using the cane never hears. So the differing structure of everybody's abundance never meets the lesson of lesson because of assembly. I talk into God to preposition the diction of grasping generosity's grace. But when black women are called God on Instagram, when the going gets tough, when the algorithms got you in a trough and rhetoric resorts hyperbole, but in life, for this poor gel we call life, when Black women know we are some, some God and say so with the heart rumble of belief, we got the psych ward. I know which wards to avoid because I've already seen them. I've died more times in 32 years than one should die. I have resurrected more than my loss. And sometimes I don't call my survival anything but empathetically motivated spite to slow stroll into my last step so my spirit won't feel the need to reemerge into a world among people again unless the West is disassembled and people adhere a community where the earth makes the first call and the last response. I we I sick from not listening to the trees. I we I sickling from not hearing the flowers. I we I sick to breaking stalks and selling bodies and burning forests and creasing up the ocean. Stop damning the ground like it ain't the ground where I yo walk. Stop damning each other like we all on a resurrection. Stop wheeling progress with guilt casters. Trust, I've built enough chairs to know appealing to the aesthetics of the master will break your back, abuse your soul, and demand you supplicate at the feet of the person kidding with the devil, advocating on his behalf as a prerequisite for contracting hell into industry. Kyrie says I'm a Luddite. Perhaps so. I do enjoy cashmere gloves and capes. My legs are stockinged. I wear long cotton sleeves, heavy alpaca sweaters, under down coats or bare arms and fur, and distrust technology because we've discarded ethics in exchange for terms of service. <laughs> I enjoy the occasional trip down Poppy Lane when the cells occlude and the pain forces front the memory of belief. And I explore memory, minutes, seconds, fractions of a second in pain because Poppy Lane pops me insane or perhaps dreaming. I need, I need not know which for insanity and dreaming allow what sanity does not. And that is existence of belief without the burden of proof. Proofing your truth is a burden. Proofing the truth is pathological. Your the is an equation. I'm no longer interested in solving by text. I had a dream about Percocet or morphine. And it told me to say, you caught me when my back is aching. When white wind plants me in liminal plantation. I'm just saying, you should see how I does go out of view when the pain do stop. 
Thank you, everyone. That was beautiful, Joselia. I'm gonna introduce Jimena Lucero. At the Slant Center of Jimena Lucero's In Times of Violence by the State, the speaker recalls that before the cops talked to us, we had to write. It is a dense crystal of a poem, its prose careening so fast that the reader must search the scene for the victims among all the moving hands. It bears so many. The Christmas tree casts to the ground, the broken walls, the scene is ominous. It builds like so many horror stories. We see the house, we love the house, we suspect the house. We see the children, we worry for the children. Our worry is validated, our fears are validated. We are not relieved, it heightens our intuitive sense that something more is coming, but there is no monster in the house, just power. But that power can never be greater than those it was intended for. Cops, kings, presidents. Power is so seldom relinquished to those who deserve it. The state forces children to write and the writing becomes the horror. The recounting of the violence is itself violence and becomes cyclically, especially, uh, cyclical, especially in the minds of the young. And with this turn, those afforded endless power wield it only to deepen the wound carved into the flesh. They turn the children's writing against the family of which the children are part. Why try to hold what you have together? Why would anyone ever write again? But what use is it to stop writing when we will still be written about, spoken about, with or without our consent, or the writer's understanding. Audre Lorde wrote in Sister Outsider, what I accept about myself cannot be used against me to harm me. What we write about ourselves, even through a speaker, even at the distance of poetry becomes a primary document, especially for marginalized writers. The speaker is always assumed to be the self. The creative impulse is assumed to be cathartic. It is a way dominant audiences consume without engaging. It is a way that they feign understanding. Naming oneself in a poem complicates that impulse. It reaches for the wheel of the poem. It claims confession and gives the reader the panorama that an artist creates of lived experience. Lucero in the poem, I went, in the poem, in one poem writes, I went into her phone and changed X to Jimena, white, uh, white dove emoji. Put a white dove emoji next to my name as to remind her I am peaceful and that I renamed myself to fly closer. In doing so, she has disowned the plausible deniability of that hoity-toity poetry critic's prize. I do not know what they gain from this imagined distance between speaker and reader, but I do know that Lucero refuses it. I know that she calls her own names in her poems and asserts a presence in her own art. I was raised and continue to work in a tradition where our names hold immense power. In our own hands, we can use our name, carve it, write it without picking up the pen as it etches the paper bag of a petition and transform our own lives. In the hands of our enemies, our names can be used to slice us apart, to the spiders and snakes in our bodies and possibly ruin or even end our lives. Jimena Lucero understands the power in her name and she doesn't take it lightly. Whether it's the name of a family, an identity, a country or her own name, Jimena looks through the many mirrors she builds in her poems some daggers, other places where others places where a woman is most alive, some her siblings' names and parents, and she reaches in and she grabs the power she deserves and that we deserve to live among. So let's begin. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce you to Jimena Lucero. As it is your first time hearing her work, I suggest you get ready. Thank you so much, Saray, um, for that beautiful introduction. I feel so honored and, and seen. Um, and Joselia, that was incredible that, that your poems, your voice, um, I'm, I, I, I 
I'm just so thankful to be sharing this space tonight. I'm, um, uh, I want to thank Akima, Kyle, and the Poetry Project for having me. Um, the first poem is Mother Becoming a Name. Um, this poem I wrote when, um, back in 2016, um, when Trump uh, was elected, um, though I think it can apply to all um, administrations um, uh, of the United States, um, uh, just based on the treatment of um, undocumented people. Mother becoming a name. The detail in your face makes me feel at home. Under this administration, I begin to draft letters of my loss. I fear no longer hearing your laugh when you speak to your carnala and she updates you on the people of El Pueblo. Llama a la compañía de teléfono. Pregúntales cuánto cuesta el plan de llamadas ilimitadas. You plan to stay in this country for as long as you can. I pick up the phone and dial, pretend I am you, and speak to an operator. You had the option to speak with your tongue that is bilingual, no need for me. My earliest memory was, was when I have represented you. There are remnants between us. Words don't suffice. I speak to the operator. Me llamo Rosa, even though my name is Jimena. I mimic your tone and you laugh. I think, when did I become your daughter? I never told you why I chose my name. Jimena, because I too am not a complete American. I demand to be seen where you have been fading. Dicen que cobran 10 dólares más al mes. We can't afford the phone plan this month. I hang up and picture you embracing the ones you left back home. Ordinary. What is at stake in the end? If not the life of a woman. I hate this violent day. My dense smile crawls into the corners of unsuspecting inspectors. The mirror is a silver danger turned dagger. Black hair swirls around my neck and it intervenes with my motion. I race hours and minutes. I lose. My body is not my genitalia, but who cares about what I think? He honks at me from his car. He is a sperm ghost. I do not notice when desire becomes rage, a very fine line. I actually printed out my poems this time. <laughs> it's a lot easier to read. Um, violence done can't be undone. And I carry this with me most days, clouds and sky. My father would say my fear of him was irritating. To give me something real to cry about, he snapped his snakeskin belt on my legs. Purple thunder silenced the landscape of my lips. My family still felt protective of our patriarch. Outs outside our home, we said he was a good man, said he was not as scary as he looked, said we loved him, that the belt wasn't so bad. 
I talked about the delicious pasta he made. Words fail truth sometimes. I told on him one day casually to my teacher. When he found out, he called for me again, knowing it had been me who defied him. I ran only looking at what was in front of me. Jottings on pain. Um, I'm so inspired uh, um, about the way that Giselia writes about pain. Um, and I think writing about pain for me is very hard. I keep journals um, about my chronic pain, um, but I think writing pain in poetry is just something I struggle with. Um, and so these are just some jottings on pain. My pain is high. I've done nothing. Just wonder where it is rooted. I have no answers. I lend my body to anyone but myself and I ignore its voice. A pain I can't cure. Star formation. Nobody wastes a body. All are worth it. All are valuable. All liberate. Tiredness. You teach my body and mind that moving into different stages is powerful. The stinging never quite stops. A flower I don't pluck. Maybe it'll ache a nerve. How do disabled organizers prevent burnout during a pandemic like COVID-19? Transitional pain, mouth clamped down with force. Foot traveled far, now homebound. Sleep it away. When I wake up, the body I inhabit has a rhythm. My family mourns X. I walk into our house and Daniel says it's like a new roommate moved in. He keeps to himself, slams his door, and I hold on to a chair as though his force will shatter every light bulb. I am more tender because a school of butterflies make up my spine. My breasts are small, the nipples dark brown screws. My ring finger is still crooked, but now cautious of knives. Daniel and I speak silence better. Our wounds remain locked in the larynx. Jenny doesn't call for X anymore. She calls me Jimena. It was easier for her to rename me. She witnessed the burial, every trace of X erased how the sun dried the bones and I ate them like I do my mom's blood orange rice. Jenny lists the ways in which we are similar. Both of us can form a village from our laughter and both of us are women. Mom tells me she misses the way X danced around the house. There is more humor in boys, she says. We walk by the mirror hanging in the dining room. I tell her, look at that girl, isn't she the most alive? In times of violence by the state. In the span of three years, our walls had been eggshell white, turquoise, navy blue, and mango yellow. Our walls were replaced because they were broken. Our family was breaking, being torn in two. Once it was the slamming of my back, several times his fist. There was the time at Christmas, he had drunk too much pink wine and Hennessy. Our plastic tree ended up on the ground, slumped with lights and ornaments. We called the police. They knew our grieving faces, or perhaps they confused us with other poor Mexicans. Before the cops talked to us, we had to write, 
trace back each incident. He harmed who, why, when, and where. On a state paper, we were mandated to capture our hurt. Then a gang of them shoved him to the ground, threatened to physically hurt him, called him homophobic slurs. Violence has a way of blurring itself. No ending, no beginning. What harm we caused ourselves what harm we cause to ourselves, oblivious to the certain truth, the state does not care for us. How's everyone doing? Let me look at this chat, okay, cool. <laughs> um, so I get super nervous every time I have to read poems. I do not know why, um, it never changes. Um, um, so I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> Nerves are good. Silver Femme. We were at your house drinking a 40 ounce. Had been a while since I drank alcohol, but your presence was worth the celebration. You looked as beautiful as you do, tall and pensive with your light brown hair. I pictured my brown crooked fingers dancing in swirls around your head, digging a hole, reaching the skull. You made me feel divine, like the glazed ceramic angels my mother hangs in her home's hallway to keep bad spirits away. The room was warm and red. I laid on your bed attempting to look sexy. You handed me your drink after your mouth was bonded to it for a minute or so. Gazing across, I gulped the alcohol, gulping you. I was glad you treated me neither like a boy, like a girl. You never used a pronoun when talking about me. I was a middle, a fume, a possibility. That night, you asked me about my gender, what it meant to me, how I pictured it. You said you wanted to learn more, be a darling confidant. A light in my chest pulsated like the massive moon behind your curtains. I hypothesized my gender far removed from our physical circumstances. The moon is trans. She shines like a silver femme, I said. Flipping through her phases, I imagined my body to belong where it wasn't harmed. You squint your eyes and I curled into myself. My astronomical concerns puzzled you, but you took me as I was, a shape-shifting soul that has a home in altering latitudes. Our friendship was reliant on futurity then. When I'd see you again, my body, still mine, would be all of the unsaid things that night, a blip in time. My mother cuts a watermelon and I argue with my brother. I just made up that title before um, this reading because I, titles are hard and um, an e the easiest title is just explaining what is happening in the poem. <laughs> Um, my mother cuts a watermelon and I argue with my brother. You have no fucking respect for women, I yell at him. Unspoken wounds hurt in my body. What routine? We argue at the kitchen table. This time you slice a watermelon in the quiet spring. Mother, when you hear me, I wonder what you think of me. He and I are bulls ready to go through the red sheet to find blood. I never shut up. Isn't this good? Doesn't this mean I can defend myself? Daniel sucks his teeth like a macho, como mi padre. You're the one instigating by bringing up feminist shit. The watermelon is spread open on an old chipped plate. Finally, you speak softly. Tienes razón, mijo. Men can do it all. He leaves the kitchen after calling us idiots. We look at each other and laugh, unworried of what any man thinks of us.
This is the section of the reading where I just do ASMR of pages flipping. Um, okay. Flying closer. The only thing I decided for myself was the name I would be called. There was a fire in my head, so I called it Jimena. A name could heal everything before this. I didn't know existence until I knew to define myself. There were others who attempted to erase my womanhood. And so I thought, what if I started from a little beginning? What is a name a Mexican mother would be proud of? My mother never wanted a daughter. When my sister was born, she said she was afraid for her, that the world is cruel to women. And when I told her I was never her son, but the dirty mirror in her imagination, she feared that I would die as I changed. Now she calls me a dangerous girl. Now she calls me a loca. When I was rebellious, I went into her phone and changed X to Jimena put a white dove emoji next to my name as to remind her I am peaceful and that I rename myself to fly closer, closer to what we have always been, women. Um, this is a new poem that I don't, I don't know where it's going. Um, um, it's called I was taught to love you before myself, which sounds like a pop song, um, but this is, I was taught to love you before myself. The blue night loops around us, building our home, keeping us married as we hurt each other. I discovered myself lonely and asleep, an anger born beneath the sky of my breast. Before your violence, I saw women around me hold on. Undoing isn't an option, just escape. You've taken my breast milk, my cheek. I sing pure memory now. I once wanted control, silly kindergarten picture, red home, green grass, clouds sparkling in the eyes of my children. Okay. Growing longing, growing up, my father would strip me naked and give me buzz cuts. I was embarrassed by my strong face. It's been war-filled centuries and my hair is protection. It gets in my face and I feel every moment of it, the seduction, the itch, the way my fingers comb through it to tame it from rise. My brows are bold and heavy. The settler colonial state imposed terror on my body, an attempted erasure of my people. Sitting under a tree, wind blows, taking with it strands of me. When I was, I, I don't remember how old I was, but there, there was um, a documentary about um, Barbara Walters interviewing um, trans youth. Um, and this poem, I think, is um, always kind of changing, I think. Um, I'm like always making edits um, to ensure that like, um, say that this documentary was actually pretty invasive. Um, Barbara Walters knew I was trans. I was alone in my parents' bedroom. Their bed was queen sized with snow white sheets. The carpet was dirty with particles of paper and food crumbs. The bulky black television showed Barbara Walters interviewing boys, girls. Minutes into the documentary, I found out that they weren't girls, boys like my brother and my sister, instead they were like me. When they were told to behave a certain gender, they cried doves from their eyes. 
One mother recalled her child saying, mom, I'm so mad at God because there was something different about her body. All of my soft spoken prayers flew by my lips. I lowered the TV's volume with fear that someone would listen. My mother was in the kitchen cooking the orange rice I loved so much. She didn't understand English, but the body translates much of what is unsaid. Barbara Walters captured my atten attention. She was an invasive detective that wanted to know why these kids claimed to be girls, boys, when they had been born boys, girls. She called them transgender, and I saw myself on television being scrutinized by a professional woman. Ms. Walters walked into my room, asked me questions with that list of hers. Unlike those kids, I didn't have freedom to be myself despite the danger that was narrated by Walters' small lips. The words were cautionary, surgeries, medicine, therapists, and death. I heard my mother's steps. The door opened and damp light gleamed over my body. I changed the channel and the smell of her rice made me hungry again. I followed my mother into the kitchen barefoot. I sat at the table and played with my food. My family never noticed how I fell into myself, how my identity was forming through words. I thought of my response to Barbara's question about being a girl in secret. I'd say still a kind of power. I'm gonna read two more poems. Dreaming the radical is necessary. She taught me how valuable words were. If everything ceased, the grass, the wind, let there be word rebellion, imagination, community. The state killed her. Laws stripped away her autonomy. She had been sick, slept and woke up to eat and write. Outside the building of catastrophe, she labored in her sleep. She labored in her bed. She envisioned a map to a safer place. The journey is now led by her descendants. The brink of our liberation is in lineage. Uh, this poem is a series of um, violences um, so there's three sections, um, violence one, violence two, violence three. Violence one. The walls in our apartment bloomed holes, often through the release of anger from my older brother. We were different and there wasn't a time where we weren't. I used to cover the holes with portraits of my favorite musicians. A picture of Selena was placed by my bedroom door. Visitors could not see the hole, but I could. It was large and my eyes swelled when I touched the broken wood. I learned to say little about myself to people who would not believe me. Women like me are taught to keep secrets until death silences us. Violence two. I, had nev I have never dared to tame a man, wouldn't want to. 
The one man I loved with my blood couldn't love me without swallowing the light of day. He was red with trauma, an ugly abstract painting I can't forget. Violence served me no purpose, not for art, not in life. In between gaps of silence, I created. Wrote in the dark in small spaces. I blamed myself because there wasn't enough light for both of us to shine and heal. I could never be proud of myself. The cold between us grew like winter. Some relationships are formed to become total ruin and leave a scar, a reminder that love does not feel this way, a reminder to run. Violence three. I stayed at Yuna's for two months, not sure where I'd end up. The few things I owned were friendships and shoplifted clothes. I was becoming more disabled and doctors didn't believe my pain. I called my mother to tell her how I was doing, always blurring the line between lies and poetry. I turned to sex for money, but I only did it a few times because my weak body couldn't hold the desires men imagined onto me. I had sex with a man whose name I never asked and he never shared. He told me all trans women should be small like you, a phrase packed with violence and threat. What he meant to say was, I could crush you and you would not be loud enough. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jimena. Um, that was such a generous and powerful and um, incredibly, incredibly candid and open-hearted reading. Thank you. And thank you to Joselia as well. And thank you to Akima and to Saray. And thank you to everyone for, um, for listening and gathering so attentively. Um, I could just feel this assembly really strongly tonight. And I feel profoundly grateful for that. So thank you. Um, our next readings are going to be Wednesday, November 18th with Jenna Osman and Ali Warren. And then on Friday, November 20th, um, we'll be with Kimberly Alidio and M. Norbesi Phillip. Um, I also wanna thank my colleague, Laura Henriksen, who organized this event and unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, um, but she brought this into being with um, tremendous, tremendous care. Um, I'm so grateful to these readers, to these introducers, um, and again, to all of you for, for being with us tonight. We'll leave the Zoom open until, let's say, 9.30. Um, and if folks want to switch on their cameras and their microphones, you're welcome to, to share and engage with one another and to continue to, to talk in the chat as well. Thank you again.